What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Pick Six Podcast, CBS Sports NFL Podcast. I'm Will Prince, I'm your host. Joining me from the luxurious new studio in Fort Lauderdale, Brady Quinn and Leger Duzable. It's oh, the Tuesdays yeah. with Brady Show. Pew, 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 pew. What's up, fellas? Oh Will, my God, Brady! You would make my so you would make Robbie's day if he knew you dabbed. That's oh, all I'm trying to do right now is just make Robbie's day. Because <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, based on you know, Santa Claus is probably good to him, but I'm sure you were not good to him Ooh. over Christmas. Will that was great to him? Are you kidding me? He was actually he was actually just watching a uh, a YouTube video where um, it was talking about certain types of parents. He goes, "What's a helicopter parent?" Uh, <laughs> I, like, I, I, I thought maybe you you used the Antonio Brown line when when telling him as far as where the gifts come from. So, oh man, no, wait, did you guys wait, see wait, that, 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 that uh, social media video where the kids, the parents, like literally wrapped coal and they made them open the gift? Yeah, and the little girl goes, "I knew it," which lets you know that she knew she was bad the whole year, and people were getting after the parents. But I'm like, when the girl comes out and says. I knew it. I knew I was getting cold. Kind of let you know where her behavior was throughout the whole year. Very <laughs> self-aware individual. I also yeah. read a story of a three-year-old hey, Brady, boy. can you can you dab again? No, we're we're good. We're gonna pass on the dab. Oh no, a little bit. Oh, there. Right. oh there, there it is. There, get it. <laughs> there we go. I love it. <laughs> dab, 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 dab. I see. It. There it is. Oh, <laughs> okay. 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 Hey, do you oh, oh, okay. know <laughs> Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Ooh, okay. Ooh, all right. Ooh, all right. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> well, well, hopefully Robbie was better than the little boy who got up at 3 a.m. and opened up all the gifts no. underneath their tree. Yeah, a little boy in North Carolina. He's uh, self-aware, too. Oh, he well, was in North Carolina? <laughs> not not good, though. So I, Where? He's got an older brother and then a little baby sister, and so unfortunately, sounds, uh, somewhere in North Carolina. I don't know where exactly in North Carolina. Child, but, yeah. Middle child, man. I'm going to look it up. I wonder where it was. <laughs> well, you can look it up in high point. It. I'm, I'm currently in High Point, North Carolina, the furniture capital. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful area. Yeah, beautiful really area. area. Yeah, yeah, we got a nice – it's actually been very um, rainy and cold and windy here, but it's very December Ooh. weather, which is not the worst thing in the world. I like rainy and cold, personally. I'm with you. I like the change of seasons. Yeah. I love when it's raining cold. When I think of a place like High Point, I think of, like, mile high cold weather. Ooh. Nice transition right there. Yeah. Oh. Um. You're saying that are you empowering me to uh yeah, to, to, to transition to Russell Wilson? You. Get it in yeah. power field, get it in power field in my eye. Come on. There's another one. Yeah, Russ uh Russell Wilson benched Ooh. by the Denver Broncos in the um I don't know what classification we're using for this in terms of call it whether we're like what we're gonna call it. Ooh. Um it's like the financial bench for financial reasons. I mean like I mean, that, don't you? I mean, that's what the reporting is. I believe Ian, Ian Rappaport of uh, NFL Network reported that. Do you buy that it's purely financial? That there's not some, um, not some. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a motivation big, here. I'm not a big conspiracy theorist, but it seems like if Jared Stidham is signed to your team in the offseason, that's the ultimate kiss of death, right? This is the same oh. scenario that Derek Carr went through last year. Let's that's not forget, true. right? Two games left in the season for financial reasons because. If he gets injured and isn't able to pass a physical, his money becomes guaranteed. Same thing with Russell Wilson, right? Two games left in the season, essentially out of the playoffs. We're not going to play Russell Wilson. We're going to bench him just in case he gets hurt and can't pass a physical in March 2024. Who's the backup quarterback in both of those scenarios? Jared Stidham. Jared Stidham. So beware. Jared Stidham signs of your team. You're on the clock. Oh, no. <laughs> um, here's the odd thing is if he ends up being the backup, for the game, that's what doesn't make any sense. Right. Where he still could go in yeah. and get injured if Stidham gets hurt or something happens along the course of the game. So that's the only part of it I don't understand. If if he's not going to be out there, yeah. make him inactive. I think and they will. That's that was my thought yeah. too, and that's why I don't anticipate him being the backup for this. Honestly, probably he probably won't even be in the building because remember Derek Carr kind of got away from the team when that happened. So well, Derek Carr and Marcus Mariota both quit the team last year when they got uh, when they got benched. Yeah, well, I don't want to quit the team. I mean, sometimes people feel like, hey, if they're moving on, you'd rather than out of sight, the out of off. mind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I it, mean, Derek Carr acted like a little emo kid and ran away with, okay, that'd be nice to me. Emo. So what did Marcus Mariota do then? Uh, he acted like a quiet emo kid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's Carr. getting to the point where I think you can now look at it and say the the Russell Wilson Denver yeah. Broncos experiment. It didn't work. 
Uh, obviously not with Nathaniel Hackett. Sean Payton's now had a year with him under his wing. He doesn't feel like he's performed good enough, which is ironically because this is a defense that if you look at their rankings, great, vastly improved from where they were earlier this year, Correct. especially versus the Dolphins. Yeah. But around the quarterback position, it's not like he's had the best supporting cast all yeah. season. On top of it, you know, statistically, he's been much improved from last year. <laughs> it's and not that bad when you compare him to the numbers of Patrick Mahomes or yeah. some of the others we're talking about. So I don't want to say he's, he's the fall guy in this yeah. case, but it just felt like Sean Payton kind of gave it a try. And, and now we move on to a, a point where they're going to be going their separate ways. Now, that being said, it's odd because I would have thought maybe they make this move after they're actually eliminated from the playoffs. Mm -hmm. I know they have like a 1% chance. <laughs> yeah. But still, it just hits a little bit different when they still actually have a chance of making it in. And the thing that's interesting, too, Brady, and if you look at their offense from where it was last year, they're still middle of the pack. They're like ranked yeah. 16. So it's not like you're getting bottom third football on the offensive side of the ball. Now, again, they haven't been explosive. They are who they are. They're going to run the ball, play action pass. Cortland Sutton's going to get three or four jump balls a game. They're going to try to hit Jerry Judy on some intermediate routes, and they're going to screen game you to death. And maybe that's why Sean Payton feels away because he feels like they're just too generic. And he can't take that next step with the current roster they have right now, more specifically the quarterback position. But to your point, right, it's night and day from what it was last year. And yeah. the defense was playing a lot better. Struggled the last two games on the defensive side of the ball. So can't just put this all on Russell Wilson in the offense. I think the hard thing for Sean Payton is if you look at his track record of offensive success with Drew Brees and the Saints, he cannot do or he cannot run that offense with Russell Wilson. Oh, not at all. With Drew Brees. Not at all. And, and, and I think if that was the thought of, of him coming in there and – that was how they're going to be able to have success. I just don't think it fits maybe what Sean Payton wants to do, and it probably doesn't play to the strengths of what Russell Wilson can do. For sure. Yeah, you know, I think it's I think it's interesting how you, you know you, you you cover this league long enough, you can sort of follow it, read the tea leaves, read between the lines, if you will. Yeah. And I mean, look, the read between the lines thing for me here is that they are going to do something completely unprecedented and eat a ton of salary cap space this That's off season the, the or a ton of dead cap money. Use up yeah. dead cap money on sal use up salary cap space on dead cap money, getting rid of Russell Wilson and moving on. And I think the other thing is, you know, you saw it in the in the preseason, um, Sean Payton hyping up Russell Wilson, saying we're going to go to the playoffs. You know, it, it was clear that he is sort of bought in to the idea that he could make <clears throat> Russell Wilson work. And now that it's not working and they're missing <laughs> the playoffs. He is. He's decided to sit to let everybody know that this is Russ's fault by virtue of benching him the final two games of the season. I, I don't know if it's that well. I just think when you're Sean Payton and you're put in this position, and you know this, Brady, sometimes coaches come into uh, situations where they don't have much leeway in what they can do. The way that Russell Wilson's contract was kind of drawn up, like Sean Payton had to give it at least a year, right? There was yeah. nothing else he could do. He couldn't just move off on him. And it's even a surprise not with the number that he has next year that they're going to go ahead and rip the Band-Aid off. That lets you know that new ownership wants to really revamp and restart this thing. And it's also interesting, will they essentially act like next year or Sean Payton's like first year instead of mm -hmm. this year? Because he's going to have to restart everything from the quarterback position and probably change up some other parts on offense as well. So if you're Sean Payton, I don't know if he was actually all the way in on Russell Wilson anyway, because I've talked about this, Brady. The marriage between him and Russell Wilson, if you look at Russell Wilson and how he plays, a lot of off-script stuff, doesn't like yeah. to throw in timing. But when he was with Drew Brees, that's what Drew Brees did really well. He yeah. threw in timing, and that's what Sean Payton wants his quarterback to do. And I knew Russell Wilson was never going to do that. So I always wondered where the, where the tug of war was going to be between these two guys. Would Sean Payton give a little and you know do some, some things Russ likes to do, but then also try to get uh, Russell Wilson to throw in timing? Russ still never threw in time, and so Sean Payton ultimately had to give up on his offense and change the offense. I don't think he ever really truly wanted to do that. I think that's also part of the frustration for a lot of play callers is, you know, when you call a play and it's there and the quarterback isn't executing yeah. it the way you want to, it then makes it extremely difficult to then operate and feel overly confident calling anything. Yeah. And so when you do have some off-script plays that end up going your way, in your mind as a coordinator, you're like, great. But the reality is, is that only lasts so long for in the sure. NFL. And so whether it's in this case, Sean Payton, Russell Wilson, or I remember like Josh Dobbs earlier this season when he got to Minnesota, he had a couple plays, took off, scrambled, run, went in. And you could tell Kevin O'Connell was he almost was like reluctant to like <laughs> yeah. be like, great, because yeah. I think he knew at some point this isn't going to last or this right. is going to help us ultimately win in the end. Um, but look, it will be a post-1 June designation, I think, if they can't trade him and if they decide to cut him. 
The reality is, though, is, you know, you don't know that it's Sean Payton ultimately making the decision. Maybe it's someone within the Walton family mm. that's taking on what could be an astronomical cap hit slash, Man. you know, dead cap money. But when you got the Walton money, I mean, it ain't do that bad. You, do what you do when you're popping. Yeah, you know and, and maybe maybe there's an ownership portion into this decision where they're coming in saying, this is the wise decision. Protect our downside in the event he gets hurt. We feel like this relationship isn't going to be able to work uh, moving on after this year. And it feels like that's where they're at right now. Mm. So just, just for clarification on the numbers and sort of the logic here is Russell Wilson, um, if he were to suffer an injury that w wouldn't allow him to pass an exit physical at the end of the year, uh, he on March 17th, I believe, his contract. His, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it would be fully guaranteed if he can't if he can't pass the physical by early March. And so basically the Broncos are trying to get out of you know this extra thirty-seven million dollars in cash that they would yep. owe Russell for the future. They already are gonna have to pay him thirty-nine million dollars in cash. Ooh, and Lord. to Brady's point, um, about which is you know just the salary for 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 next year, I believe. So eighty-five million in dead cap money in That's terms crazy. of the twenty twenty-four season, if they were to cut him before uh, June 1st. If they release Ooh. him post June 1st, there'd be $35.4 million in dead cap space uh, for the team in 2024 and $49.6 million in dead cap space uh, for the team in 2025. <clears throat> if they can trade Ooh. him before June 1st, $68 million in dead cap space and their cap savings would be negative $32.6 million. <laughs> Pretty insane. Um, a post Nobody's June first for that contract, right? Exactly. <laughs> a post June first trade, just well, for the record, would be eighteen point four million dollars in dead cap space, saving them seventeen million dollars, but forty nine point six million dollars in dead cap space for next year. So this is truly unprecedented. Yeah, you know, we've seen this with Carson Wentz. We've seen yeah. it with I think the the Packers. You know, think about eating cap space for Aaron Rodgers. We've seen it with you know teams of teams have just been willing to eat these giant cap hits. To get to move on from these these mistakes, but this would be completely unprecedented. Yeah. Well, they can eat the cap numbers because they can afford it with the money that they're bringing in right now to yeah. the new TV contract. That's the reality of it. And you're also talking about an organization with a new ownership group that's one of the wealthiest families in the thing. world. It's so, well, yeah, the cash wise, but I mean, I'm talking like. <laughs> if you're taking a $49 million dead cap hit, your salary is going to be to put a roster out there yeah. next year. Yeah, you're, you're operating like the, you operate like the Oakland A's out here. No. And, and then there, there's, there's some, there's truth to that. But then you look at an, an organization like the Rams and what they've done, basically building around Matt Stafford, Aaron Donald yeah. and Cooper cup. And you see how that works out. So it can be done. And I think that's maybe one of the reasons too, where they're a little bit more bullish on what that's going to look like in the future. Mm. If they can find Sean Payton with the quarterback that would fit more of what he wants to do. I think it's more interesting. If you think about like, if he could get traded, you know, obviously Denver might be on the hook for a portion of that contract. And that's maybe how the trade gets done. Yeah. Cause maybe they don't want to absorb that cap. hit, even if it is a post June one designation uh, for cutting them. So the reality is, you know, who would be potential fits? Well, I would look at Tampa and say, well, Dave Canales was with him as his quarterback coach in Seattle, but Baker Mayfield's having such a good year. You're going to get him a much better discount. And I think you want to continue that momentum. Sure. So that's not a really a fit. You look at their offense coordinator in Seattle. Now, Shane Waldron, Waldron yeah. maybe he would look at potentially going somewhere else as a head coach Ooh. and want to bring him in and see if he can't revamp some of that. You know, he's worked with Brian Schottenheimer, who's now in Dallas. I don't think the Cowboys are moving on from Dak Prescott. Yeah. They've already got Trey Lance sitting there too. You know, you start looking at some of the different places and with Man. a loaded quarterback class with Caleb Williams and Drake May and, you know, maybe Jaden Daniels is, and then Michael Penix and whoever else we want to throw into the conversation, much cheaper options. Right. I think at a minimum, if you're not talking about a trade and just signing them as a free agent, but either way, I mean, probably much cheaper options coming into the league. So uh, it will be fascinating to see if he gets released, who ends up being a suitor or if he gets traded who would be interested interested in bringing on that contract and what those details look like in the trade? Do you think that there's a possibility if he does get released that he could potentially retire? I don't know about that. I mean, I think he's got aspirations outside of football off the field and, you yeah. know, whether it's being on TV or anything else, like he, he'd be successful at that. I, I think the question is more of, would he be interested in being a bridge quarterback? Whereas someone might only bring him in for a year or two short-term deal 
to then prove it. Does he want to go through that scenario? I think in one like Carson Wentz. Yeah, I mean, at one side, you've you've obviously done enough in the league where you feel like you shouldn't be in that position. But on the other end of it, like if you have to prove it, so be it. You yeah. know, you, you've already, you know, you might say I've made enough money. I can gladly go prove it for a year and then and maximize on the back end of it. Mm-hmm. It really comes down to where he sees himself personally outside of the game of football, what, what how he sees his future, in my opinion. I mean, yeah, he's now going to. I was going to say, he's now going to have had Pete Carroll and Sean Payton give up on him in in the span of less than five, in like three years, which is not great. Well, well, two of the greatest coaches in NFL history. Yeah, which is not a good look. And you were talking about Canales and Shane Waldron. That's the thing. When when Waldron came over there, more of that West Coast offense, it was more timing-based. That's where Russell really struggled the last couple years in Seattle. That's why they kind of wanted to move off of him. So I don't think Canales would look at him in Tampa. And, and if Shane Waldron were to get a job, I don't think he would probably look at him either. It'd be interesting to see what Seattle does with Geno now. Again, if he finishes the season strong and they go into the playoffs, I think he still is the quarterback of the future. But he has been banged up this year. And I know a lot of people have been asking, will Seattle look at a quarterback potentially in the draft? So well, uh, look at the other p- potential quarterbacks that could be traded, right? Like yeah. I don't – think the Bears should trade Justin Fields, but oh, gonna they it. are going to have probably the number one overall pick. So yeah. if they do and they want to take a quarterback, they could. Yeah. Would you rather have Fields? Would you rather have Russell Wilson? You know, given either Upside, Fields, I think Fields. Fields' current contract situation, he probably will need an extension yeah. at some point, but you have some control. With Wilson, you know at least what you're dealing with. Yeah. So th- there's a lot of nuances to it. I think there's a number of veteran quarterbacks, too, who could be in that conversation of, yeah. hey, who am I in competition with the trade for? Who do we want to go trade for uh, if we're looking for a quarterback next season? What do you, what do you think about Will's team, Carolina, potentially bringing him in if he gets released? Uh, it, it's it's fascinating to see. I mean, obviously, we got to see who the head coach is first. Correct. I think that's where we get a sense for, you know, what they're trying to do. I, I personally feel like based on what David Tepper has said, yeah. they're still in on all in Bryce Young. You oh, bring yeah, a guy sure. who's won a Super Bowl, been to two Super Bowls, I don't, I don't think that's sending that message. Of the young, yeah, young that's, that's sending a different message. I got so. you. And yeah, even, and, even the Raiders could potentially be a spot, too, I think, yeah. with Aiden yeah. O'Connell. Well, and, and let's not forget, like, if you bring him into Carolina, it's then David Tepper would be admitting that he, the, the Bryce Young thing failed. And I, I think someone what else is going to get fired for that first. Uh, maybe several first. people get fired for that first. first. Uh, Monday night, Christmas night, got a crazy – co- uh, We actually, we didn't get a crazy comeback because the 49ers <laughs> – but we did get a crazy comeback stat. The 49ers have never come back under Kyle Shanahan from eight-plus points, eight or more points. It was a little – Fourth quarter. Yeah, in the fourth quarter. It seems a little cherry-picky to me. Um, yeah. And it's tough to come how back. Many, how many games eight. is – how many times have we been down eight in the fourth quarter is what I want to know. 397,000. Uh, I think, what is it, 0 and 38? I think they're 0 and 38 or 0 and 39. 0 and 38. But, uh, I mean, that's, everyone, hold on, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> to do some sort of sample size saying, yeah. okay, what's the disconnect? That's only that's only one score. Yeah, but th- this is my thing. If you look at it in totality, I think only the Chiefs have a decent number in regards yep. to percentage as far as coming back 8 plus. They're 0 and 38. Yeah, but everybody else is, I think percentages is like 10, 11%. It's, not it's like 17%. It's it is, it is, it is. They're over. I mean, right. I'll it's, put it this way. It's, it's telling. Here's what's telling is it's it's crazy that they're 0-38 considering his offensive accuracy. Correct. <laughs> like, he's widely viewed as maybe the best offensive mind in the NFL. True. And if that's the case, it, it just, I think it shows you a little bit when, when they can't run the football. Mm-hmm. And maybe this is a byproduct of, what the quarterback position has been since he's been there. Yeah. But clearly they're they're not going to be able to run the same offense. And if that's the case, yeah, you're going to struggle as any offense. Mm-hmm. But it's just crazy that even more so considering how good he's been when you are you are in that situation. That's yeah. what stands out at least. Do you think it kind of makes them like front runners in, in regards yes. to that's a telling stat, like you said, oh, for them to will. be over, like will wants to buy I'm not gonna say they're front, front runners, runners, but it's just like you can't come back in one game where you're down by eight points in the fourth quarter. Like that's a struggle. That's what I'm saying. Like, you might luck yourself into that. You got, you got like a fumble return for a touchdown. You find your way. But that's the thing. And this is what I try to tell people. When you look at that stat, right, and, and you know this, Brady, sometimes when you're down by eight or ten in the fourth quarter, you need some luck to happen right. to be able to come back, right? It's about executing at a high level. And then you got to hope that team makes mistakes, right? Because if they don't make mistakes, no matter what you're doing on offense, you're not going to be able to come back. So, like, you need some luck in those scenarios. Perfect example, last year – the, the Browns and Jets game. Like, there was no reason the Jets were supposed to win that game, but they get a busted coverage. You get a 75-yard touchdown. 
Then they get an onside kick, right? And then they score with like 13 seconds left. So you need a little bit of luck when you're in those scenarios. I mean, what is that stat? Like, of course, you throw five interceptions in a game. <laughs> of course, you can have the worst turnover differential in one week, like a one week sample size. For sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I do think it's kind of interesting that the idea, I mean, I, I'm not saying that this is true, just that when you combine Brock Purdy with the way that Kyle Shanahan calls plays, is it possible that it is a front running offense that, and and just because of like what the offense is, the offense is built to have these, you know, these zone running plays, right? Zone blocking run plays. And then you build the play action and then the play action always looks similar to what the, any good play action looks similar to a regular run play, but that's like really the, the basis of the offense. So does it, having to just do straight dropbacks all the time and not being able to run and then build off of the play action. Do you think the inability to do, to do that is sort of the Achilles heel of that Kyle Shanahan offense? Uh, I don't know if it's an Achilles heel. I mean, some of it can be personnel related, right? Mm. Like who would we say their best personnel grouping is probably their base personnel. Yeah. When you have Kittle, Kittle and use check and McCaffrey, obviously then Ayuk and, and Debo Samuel, right? Like they go three wide. <clears throat> like, are they better? Mm-hmm. Like, when they add a piece and take off use check or, Ooh. or, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I think that's the hard part is their base personnel was probably the most talented group. Correct. And in those situations, that's not what you're utilizing. You're using, yeah. uh, utilizing three wide receiver sets. Yeah. So use checks coming off, you know, yeah, you got Kittle staying on, but you might need to use them for help in pass protection, depending on the looks Ooh. and the pressure and, and who's at defensive end you're going against. So that's the hard part is like, you take away, in essence, in that that scenario, uh, either you're you're obviously your best tight end is one of your best players, uh, what your best one of your best uh, players catching the football, blocking all that, and use check. And by the way, maybe Christian McCaffrey, because now all of a sudden, if I only have a tight end and running back on the field, I need a seven man protection because of a blitz look, a pressure, or maybe we need a chunk and I need more time. And our offensive line struggling. Now McCaffrey's out of it as part of that too, and he's yeah. in protection. So now I've got Debo Samuel and Ayuk, but you know who's the number three? Is it Jawan Jennings or you know who do you feel really good about? Yeah. There's some rosters you look at when they go three deep, like for example, when the Bengals are healthy. Correct. Yeah. Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd. My God, like that's their based offense. <laughs> yeah, like, like that, that's what you're throwing out there yeah. when you when you get out in your openers, right? Like that's first quarter to fourth quarter. That's not the case for the 49ers. So it's not a flaw. I just think when you look at their roster components, how they're set up you know, it takes them out of what their best personnel grouping is and and some of conceptually what they do best. Yeah, and if you look well, at their offense, right? Well, dudes, I was, dudes, Go ahead. I was going to ask too, like, as, like from a, like, like when you're, as a defender, like if you're watching these guys, because, you know, when you're, when you're trailing by double digit points, you're not yeah. going to be running as much. And so you're not like some of George Kittle stuff is like, he, he like fakes run, but like, you know, he goes to fake the run block and then releases and takes off on the play action. Is that something that like you can kind of pick up on tells as well? I mean, if we're in the fourth quarter and you're down by double digits, we're not respecting the run. We're not respecting your play action pass. We're, we're, we're pinning our ears back and getting to the quarterback. And to Brady's point, right? I think it also shows some deficiencies in this offense. I know we talk about Kyle Shanahan and him schematically and how he sets things up, but they have a real issue at offensive line, right? If Trenton Williams goes down like he did last week, we saw the issue. And even when he's playing, right? If you look at the right side, McKivicks, he struggled. They've struggled in the interior three as well. And that's because they haven't been able to allot a lot of money to the offensive line because they're playing so many people on the outside with Kittle and Debo Samuel. They're going to have to play Brand, uh, Brandon Ayuk. Christian McCaffrey's making a lot of money. Trent Williams is one of the highest paid offensive tackles. And then you look at the defensive side, everybody is paid on that side. So right. when you look at them and you talk about, well, is it, you know, you calling them front runners? No, they're just not set up to play from behind like that because one, they can't just seven minute, seven step drop back because they don't have the offensive line to do it especially if they don't keep George Kittle in to help with that right side of the offensive line. And that really wasn't Brock Purdy's experience too at Iowa State. I mean, they were more of a two tight end set, Correct. you know, type team when, when he was playing there. So I don't know that his, you know, Whatever calling card is Campbell, by the way. spread it out and throw it around. Yeah. So Matt Campbell, remember when he was a hot NFL name? Still a good college coach. Yeah, yeah he's still a good program builder. Yeah. I, I'm oh, just saying, dude, they get thrown out as like the guy who's going to get hired by every NFL team every offseason. No, not so much. I don't remember, always I, two coaches for college. I, I, don't, I don't remember hearing that in NFL standards. I, I do remember hearing it more in college, and I yeah. think there's still some people who believe that, and, and especially. Sorry, I don't point, want to like, derail. Talk about Matt Campbell. Go back, back to the forty nine. <laughs> you brought it up. I mean, it's I just, know. <laughs> this is what we do on this show. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, like I just, it's, it's just. Do you think that? 
I'm going to put my Pete Prisco bald cap on real quick. Uh-oh. Um, is there a he chance? His voice, though. Is there a chance that is there a chance that Kyle Shanahan is a choker? Um, no. Yeah, he does. He does have a history that. in the playoffs of not exactly closing. I'll, I'll, I'll say this: I'll say go this. to the NFC Championship game like, like every year and be a choker. <laughs> no, but like in all seriousness, like you look at the skill sets of the quarterbacks he's had when since he's been there. Yeah. Like they're not that different, right? They're not. I mean, all. like for example, you look at the athleticism and ability of like a Lamar Jackson. You're mm-hmm. like, holy cow! Like, we're, like when we're talking about like MVP conversation, right. you're like, whoa, that dude looks like the MVP. And and granted, I understand Brock Purdy had a bad game, but there's also a portion of it where you're like, well, he can't do what Lamar can do. Like, if nothing's there, Lamar can still beat you. You know, he can still force a defense to right. slow down their rush. You're not getting that from Brock Purdy. And, and even when Sam Darnold came in. And, and this isn't just my opinion. Like Daniel Jeremiah mentioned this. Like yeah. you see the arm strength, the velocity, and you're like, yep, man, there's a different that. level of, of ability to just on your own roster mm-hmm. in Sam Darnold's arm versus Brock Purdy's. So I would say athletic ability too. I think Sam's probably a little bit better athletically than uh, maybe. Than Purdy. So all I'm saying is like, I it's just, it's hard because I think he's had a very similar quarterback in the sense of guys who are, you know, able to play from the pocket, good distributors of the football good decision makers can move within the pocket, but they're not threatening a defense in any fashion, really running the football. And I'd be curious to see like, what would a Lamar Jackson look like in a Shannon? We saw with RG three yeah. for like one year in Washington, he wins offensive rookie of Prolific the year. Numbers up. So yeah. we know he can do it, but it's like, he hasn't had that in San Fran. Well, remember that was a rumor a while ago, but before they took Trey Lance, could they potentially trade for Lamar Jackson? I think that's what Kyle was thinking when he drafted Trey Lance. Like, Let's see if I can get an athletic quarterback that can still process and read the defense. And we knew Trey Lance was going to take him a while to do that because he didn't play a lot in college. But with his athletic ability, that's a plus one. I've never had that at quarterback. So I think that's what he was thinking. But then, you know, Brock Purdy came along and processed really well, got the ball in his hands. And that's what college used to, right? So he was like, well, I got to go with this guy because this is what I'm accustomed to. I can't throw Trey Lance out there and wait two or three years for him to really develop. Right. Yep. All right. Let's take a quick break and we come back. New Year's resolutions in the NFL. Next. Uh-oh. The Scudetto, where the soul of Italy meets the pinnacle of Calcio. Catch Seria on CBS Sports Network and streaming live on Paramount Plus. Okay, New Year's. Do you guys like New Year's resolutions? I don't if you know. actually adhere to them and follow them. Yeah. <laughs> Most people's New Year's resolutions are like gym memberships. They join sure. up January. <laughs> they stop going by February. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we had a situation where like the the gentlemen we were individually sat. It was like a group of guys, a group of gals, you know, same, you know, all tra- like traveling on a trip together. Kids are going to bed. New Year's. Uh, and we were watching like the NC State, uh, Arizona State game. And all the, all the dudes were sat down and being like, here's your, and we're told what their news was like, what's your main New Year's resolution? And my, buddy, uh, my buddy Nathan goes, he goes, I'm going to stop doing as much stuff I don't want to do. And they're like, that's great. That's great. Everyone else is like, oh, what? Nathan, great job, Nate. Thanks, buddy. How did that, how'd you pull that one off? So that maybe that's that, maybe your New Year's resolution, Brady. Stop doing as much stuff you don't want to do. I agree with that. I was just actually thinking about that today uh, with a couple things that were coming my way. I'm like, I don't really want to do this. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Like, I just, I've got a lot on my plate it. right now. I, I really don't want to do this. So that's how, that's how you know that, that's how you know you're getting into your like, you're like, you're, that's, that's the feeling you get as like you hurdle towards 40 is like, you're like, you know what? I No, I'm not going to do that. I don't think it, so. It's not even that it's like time is so scarce, Man. especially yeah. when you become a dad you and when you've got back. four kids, like I never get enough time with any one of my kids. So like when I have free time, it's hard to want to then spend it with other people who are not one of those four. And so that's, that. that's usually the biggest issue for me, really. Just, I just want to be around my kids more. Real, real, uh, real, I'm Catholic humble brag there with the four kids coming. Uh, okay. <laughs> Catholics have more kids. They do. Is that a t-shirt? Is that, is that Catholics have more kids? <laughs> yeah. Is that, um, is that what I'll do now? I make the t-shirt and just walk around when I have my, my family, my yeah. gaggle of kids. Yeah. I'm with the Catholics. <laughs> The uh, New Year's resolution. Let's look ahead to 2024 resolutions. And I'm going to ask you this one: Should Mark Davis? What should Mark? Should Mark Davis's New Year's resolution be to hire the interim coach this time? I don't even think that's a resolution. That's, that's a no-brainer. Like you already had a hiccup 
a couple of years ago with Rich Basaccia and everything that he did to keep that team together. And Brady, you know this. As a head coach, you got to be a leader of men first. Like you can have all the schematic head coaches you want, but at the end of the day, can you galvanize a team? And we've seen it now twice with the Raiders. Like yeah. saw Rich Basaccia, we saw Mark Davis not do what he's supposed to do. He tried to go with the sexy name and bring in McDaniel, and it didn't work. Now let's see if he's learned his lesson. And because this Raiders team, a lot of people thought they were out of the playoffs. They're still in the playoffs, yeah. especially after a big win versus the Kansas City Chiefs last uh, week. And we've seen this team kind of take on the characteristic, the, the mentality of Antonio Pierce. Like, gritty. he was a gritty defender. I played with him my rookie year. One of the smartest guys I've ever played with. And his team has really taken on that mantra. So, to me, this ain't a resolution, Will. This is a no-brainer. Like, it should have already been done. Take the interim off Antonio Pierce's name as head coach mm. of the Vegas Raiders. Yeah, I think that – you know, New Year's resolution is like, don't mess this up. You know? <laughs> Pretty much. Like, hey, don't mess this up again. And, and and it's not just Antonio Pierce. To me, it's their interim general manager, Correct. Cam Kelly, too. Yeah. Like, you have two guys who I think so far have worked well together. It makes a lot of sense because he wanted that with Josh McDaniels and their former general manager, right. too. So that was all part of it. But now I think you have right now a bona fide leader of men that's doing something that we haven't seen before. Like, if you were going to tell me last week before the game, hey, uh, the Raiders are going to win, and they're not going to complete a pass for three quarters of That's the game. Crazy! I'd be like, "What the hell happened? Did Mahomes get hurt? Exactly. Like, like how is that possible?" So, uh, there's no doubt. It's if, if you're Mark Davis, like, don't repeat history in this case. Hire Antonio Pierce. Hire Champ Kelly. And, and to put it before we move forward, like, what's the last time that we remember a Raiders team being a top ten in defense? But I, by the way, the last 20 years, Rich Versace and Antonio Pierce have the two best win percentages. That, exactly. So like, yeah. Derek Carr never had a top 10 defense. This is a top 10 defense. This, just to put this in perspective, the Raiders defense has been a laughing stock of the NFL for like the last 20 years. And Antonio Pierce has really, like I said, brought that mantra over there. And also Patrick Graham, I think, should be getting some looks as yeah. a head coach. He's done a really good job, too, of, of getting those players to, to buy in and play really good football. Yeah. I'm I'm with you 100%. Let's stick into stick in the AFC West and the uh, the the coaching hires. Mm. Chargers resolution needs to be that they tap their full potential. How do they do that? Who do they hire? <laughs> Arbs? No, it's it's going to be our guy Ben Johnson most likely. You I think, think so? I think that's to me it makes the most sense. If you're him, right, you're probably going to have your pick of the litter. Why not? Tie yourself with a guy like Justin. A Herbert. first time head coach again, though? Mm. I don't know the hottest name. Yeah, I, I think Harbaugh has a lot, though, only because he's had success at both levels. Michigan Harbaugh, right? Yeah. 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 yeah not John Harbaugh. Yeah. Hey, John. Yeah. yeah. It's not hey, Lee Bolton. People have been talking about Mike Thomas potentially getting traded or leaving and going somewhere else. That's an interesting one. You're right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I'm the Chargers, like, I go all in on finding the guy. And if Mike Tomlin's available, like, I'll put it this way. Leader, man. I mean, again, I'm, I'm making the phone call. Yeah. Hey, you guys want to trade Mike Tomlin? If, I mean, I would. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, Bill Belichick's the interesting one, too. Do you call Robert Kraft and say, hey, let's bring him in, see if he rebuilds this, or are you kind of moving past Bill Belichick? As long as he's not the GM, because his track record as GM has not been good. No. <laughs> it has not been good at Johnson all. is going to ultimately be the Chargers head coach. I just think yeah. for him, that's probably the most attractive place to be in regards to knowing you got Justin Herbert. Now, the question is, they're in cap hell. Like, yeah. So what are they going to do with Allen? You know, also Khalil Mack, also Joey Bosa's contract. Like, they, got, they got some math to do, like, in regards to the GM and getting numbers right to make sure that they have enough to actually bring in pieces. So that's something that Ben Johnson, I'm sure, when he's going through the interview, interview process, teams are interviewing him. He's going to have those questions for the team as well, too. Like, what's the plan in regards to fixing this roster? Because, we're like I said, we're in cap hell. Right, <laughs> right. Does true or false? The Chiefs' resolution, Travis Kelsey's resolution, should be to break up with Taylor Swift. Because she is causing the downfall of the Kansas City Chiefs. They're struggling right now with her. She's being deemed as the Yoko Ono right it now. Literally <laughs> has. <laughs> the NFL, I saw. I saw an article like the NFL's over her. The like, Chiefs fans were over her. Yeah. She's Brady Quinn. I, I'm going to write that tonight. Brady Quinn calling. Taylor Swift, the Yoko Ono of the NFL. I, I did not. That was already, by the way, I saw that somewhere else. I was like, that's interesting. Um, but it, it, by I mean, the way, can you imagine if like if you got if you got dragged slash canceled by Swifties and you're yeah. and you're like, 
and your your like your daughters who are obviously obsessed with Taylor Swift were like like got like like went back to school after the obsessed. Christmas break. Uh, yeah. A little young. I don't know about obsessed. Uh, yeah. They're too young, you know. Yeah. But I think one thing they're obsessed with is football right now, and they don't like the results that they're getting from the Chiefs, <laughs> from Chiefs. especially <laughs> when Daddy laid the points with the Chiefs last week. <laughs> Man. What are you? Um, I mean, what's I mean, what's going on with him for real? Though, like, is this a situation they're, where they can fundamentally broken? They have no identity on offense. Uh, really we me and Brady actually talked about this after the Raiders game. We did the, the post game show, and if you look at this team, right? I thought for a good portion of the game, they could go with 12, 13 personnel because it seems like Mahomes is more comfortable in doing that. I thought also Isaiah Pacheco coming back would give them a little burst on offense, right? But then he ends up getting a concussion, and he's out. And even when he was, was in the game, they didn't run the ball well. Mm-hmm. So when you look at this team, I just think they're fundamentally broken. And I actually said this a few weeks ago. When you look at the nuances, right, the details, like Eric Bieniemy, I heard has been a stickler for that, right? Yeah. We heard some commanders players come out and say how demanding he is. Well, that's what he did with the Chiefs last year. And we've heard, you know, LaShawn Shady McCoy come out and other players saying how demanding Eric Bieniemy is. Well, I think they're missing that because how many times have we seen, you know, miscues on offense, whether it's Kadarius Toney lining upside, which is still crazy to me that, MVS did it twice in the game when you lost the game because of it yeah. just the week before. So, like, those nuances, those details, I think Eric Bieniemy not being there has really hurt this offense. And then I think it's also a personnel issue, right? When you look at the receiving position, right? Rasheed Rice has kind of come on as of late, but Sky Moore never took that jump. No. Nope. Kadarius T- Tony has regressed, right? right? So guys that they were depending on, they haven't taken that next step. So I don't think they can fix this. I told Brady this on, what was it, Monday when we, we did the post game. I honestly think they should lean on their defense, right? Their defense gave up six points, Will, and, and they lost the game. Right. Right. Your defense is good enough where they're going to keep you in games. I don't think we ever would say this with Patrick Mahomes. Just don't lose the game on offense, and we yeah. still got a chance to win. And, and that's where the Chiefs are right now. Yeah, that's a little bit of an indictment. As much as you're missing Eric Bieniemy, maybe it's also Matt Nagy not being really what you lost in Eric Bieniemy as far as Facts. what you're bringing back. Um, I think it's a good point about leaning on the defense, but what that means offensively is you got to run the football. you got to possess Correct. the ball. You have to limit the amount of, of, of you know, uh, touches that your opponent gets. And, and that's something that is not Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes style Never football. has been. <laughs> hey, Will, look up these stats, though. Look up Rasheed Rice's stats receiving right now as compared to Juju Smith-Schuster in the regular season. Because I think it's kind of telling. Like, this is a team that got Ooh, away that's good. with Kelsey and Juju Smith-Schuster without Tyreek Hill last year and it led to a Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I kind of keep going back to, well, what are the two biggest differences? Well, they don't have the enemy. That's yep. one thing. But the offensive line play has not been anywhere close to what it's awful. Yeah. And the tackles in particular. So yeah. that's been the area that I think they've missed out on. And they really haven't adapted to, right? I, I, we talk about, you know, what do you have to overcome sometimes as an offense? Maybe you can't run as many 11 personnel sets with three wide receivers Correct. because – you need help at the tight end position and chipping on the way out. What's well, hard to do that when Travis Kelsey is by far and away your best option. You don't right. have anyone else you can rely on. So th- there's a lot of issues, but I think the absence of the enemy, um, the way the offensive line has played in particular on the edges have played the biggest role. And then honestly, you know, Patrick Mahomes too, and <laughs> yeah, forcing totally. some things, trying to maybe do a little bit too much at times instead of just living to play the next down and relying on that defense. Right. That's something too. Like he's, if throughout his career been able to make that big play, well, it's easier when you have Tyreek Hill. It's easier when you have those other guys stepping up. They don't have that. And, and so now you have to play a different style of football where you're not a game changer. Maybe you have to be more of a game manager and yeah. how you go about managing the, the game scenario and playing in tighter games. Uh, Rasheed Rice actually has looking? better stats than, um, than Juju Smith-Schuster did through 15 games. Mm-hmm. Really, which, which is interesting, and not a lot of people know that. He, I think, he's got more touchdown passes. He's, more he's yards. come on really strong the last couple of weeks. He has, and then they featured him. So, like, that's as you look into like this week, that's what needs to be featured and continue because you know you're not going to find it anywhere else. Yeah. And that's the position right now that the Chiefs are in. They've got to rely on a rookie to step up, much yeah. like they did last year. They're, those rookie players in the secondary yeah. to step up in big moments on defense. They need that now from Rasheed Rice on offense. Yeah. This this is actually uh, kind of insane. So I looked at um, weeks 1 through 15 for Juju Smith-Schuster um, last year, and um, he was inactive in week 10, so you know, take that for what it's worth. 96 targets, 74 catches. Uh, Rasheed Rice through 15 games, 96 targets, 74 catches so far this season. Oh, wow. Crazy, right? Yeah. 
Uh, Juju, Juju had like sixty that. more. Juju had like fifty or sixty more yards over the over those fifteen games. But Rishi Rice has four more touchdowns over those fifteen games. So it really is like like as much as we say you you're not. I, I mean, I think it kind of falls on Kelsey, and I don't think it's Taylor Swift. Um, but I'd be yeah. if it would get us five million podcast listens, I would I would be fine with that. Um, I, I think it falls on Kelsey and just sort of struggling some uh, this year. And then the offensive line. You know, it's just not 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 as good. All right, let's yeah. take a break. When we come back, Thursday Night Football, next. Oh. There's more than just pride on the line. It's a top-of-the-table old firm derby. Celtic, Rangers, Saturday on CBS Sports Network. All right, we are having um, – it's a long story, but we'll just dive into Thursday Night Football. We've got about four minutes to – wrap up the Thursday night football discussion. So just keep that in mind before we get to it, though, I should point out Brady Quinn, Reve- Brady's revenge. Montezuma's, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know like we were Flacco's. doing it two weeks in a row, man. Flacco's I think it's, revenge. Well, no, yeah. I think he's talking about the fantasy thing. Yeah. Oh, Montezuma's yeah, revenge. Well last yeah, week? he did. He did really well. <laughs> yeah. You, uh, you actually beat, you beat dues uh, 167.3 to 137.1. You can thank... Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy, literally. <laughs> Brock had 2.4 points. <laughs> Debo 9.4. 49ers defense, a scant yeah, four man, points. Yeah, 49ers defense killed recorded. me. Lamar went off. Justin Jefferson went off. Mike Evans went off. But you mentioned Joe Flacco. Will he go off? Is it a Joe Flacco Ooh. revenge game revenge. against the Jets? Or is it – remember last year with the Jets – Joe Flacco actually beat the Browns beat with the one of Browns. the craziest comebacks yeah, ever. We thought the game we talked about earlier in the show. It's wacko for Flacco. Man. I mean, that's where we should be right now. Is he throwing for 1,300 yards in four games? I got, I mean, I got a hot take. I don't know what you think about this. Since week 13, as far as yards per game. Oh, yeah, it is the, it is the Brady oh, it and Deuce ball. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> I, got a, I got a hot take about Joe Flacco. I'm curious what you think. Joe Flacco can win the Super Bowl with the Browns. Yes. With this defense, with the, with that defense with I'm, this I running be game, this O line, Amari, Co- Amari Cooper and Joku like making enough plays in the passing game, yes, they they have the components of you get in those bad weather games, you have to be able to run the they football, play, play any the type defense, of, any type and of he's got the experience. If he takes care of the football, I mean, you know, we've seen some at times he's obviously turned it over, but yeah, I, I don't think there's any doubt about it. Like I think. They're going wacko for Flacco in Cleveland right now, and rightfully so. I think they've got a shot if they get in. Hey, this is my what do you thing. what do you what do you, do you think Flacco. our what do you what do you think our corporate overlords would think about a Browns Buccaneers Super Bowl? <laughs> oh, <laughs> they would hate. Be that. so sexy. Yeah. Could you imagine how sexy uh, that would be? Those two fan bases in, in Las Vegas. <laughs> There's a big, <laughs> big, big wild. They'd be swimming, the, swimming like the that, Bellagio though. fountain the whole Browns time. Browns fans would the go. Fans would be crazy though. Browns fans, Browns fans in the Super Bowl, like. It would be such a big story. Oh, oh, God. What about Browns Lions Super Bowl? Oh, huge. Yeah, both of those fan bases travel well. So they travel well, and it would be like the ultimate, like somebody is getting a big time monkey off their back here. Yeah. And like facts. Cleveland, like those fans would be fighting in the streets in like the strip, like about, no, we're the bigger losers. <laughs> um, anyway. So, real quick, uh, real quick, game preview. Yeah. Simeon starting. Yeah. The running games look good. The defense is good. Like, are you like the Jets in this one? You, you tend to lean that way oftentimes. What's the line? Seven and a half? Seven last six, time I looked. Seven. Six and a half, oh. seven, yeah. God, it went down. I like that seven and a half. I don't like that seven. I like the, you know what? I like the just to cover. Give yeah, me the you just, know. I do. Well, well you know why I say that, right? Short week, right? Flacco, even yeah, though. In Cleveland. Yeah. Listen to me. Even though Flacco has played out of his mind, right? It's And he's not a typical backup, but we usually see this, Brady, right? After three or four games, the real person shows up. What does that mean for Simeon then? He's only played two games. So hot hands. <laughs> oh, no, you know what? I really love the under in this game. Okay, there you go. That's there what I'm playing. On that. The I'm under in this game. I think this is literally going to be like a ten to, to three game. Oh, it is not that low. It's difficult it's be to that project low, points. To be honest with you, I think it's going to be like a ten. Yeah, I think it's going to be twenty to ten. Twenty to ten, Cleveland. What's the, what's the I number? Got the Brown, I've got the Browns staying wacko for Flacco. Ooh, you're going to make this what wacko for game? Flacco thing work if it kills you, aren't you? Um, it, the over under here is 35, just slightly the under Browns, by the way, up to seven and Ooh. a half. I told you, so I like the seven and a half. That is gonna kill you. It's okay. <laughs> I, just, I said 20 to 10. I just said 20 to 10. I like the under more than anything in this game for sure. Yeah, 11 to 2 play. is my prediction. Browns beat the Jets 11 to 2. 
One thing that just do get that's a cover safeties. though. That's a cover. That's a cover. <laughs> that all would right. be a cover. That's not. Nice. We all we 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 we're, we're we're terrified of the. We like. I think you like the hook, right? You like the. You think the Browns cover the seven? I was saying, if I get that hook, I'm taking it just to cover that all day. But all right. I'm, I'll lean more towards taking the under in this game. Yeah. Yep, I think the under is the play as well. All right, that'll do it for us. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. For news for Brady, it's Merry Days. Oh man, see you guys in the new year. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's right. Happy, <laughs> Happy New, new year. year. Happy New Year. <laughs> See ya.